Like, so we're moving right along to so what we're at the uh, beginning of week seven already. So it goes quickly. So today I'm going to talk about uh, construction engineering. So this will be kind of like the last of the disciplines that I've uh, planned out for the term. So construction engineering today, uh, on Wednesday, you've got the second poster presentation. You've got your alumni roundtable that uh, you're working on to end of this week. So there's no quiz this week because of those activities. And then next week, uh, like the next two weeks, we got a variety of topics kind of just rounding out that are applicable to all the disciplines. So we'll look at sustainability, talk about licensure, engineering economics, and then that Wednesday before Thanksgiving is a work session. Uh, since last week of the term, you've got your Final group project. So uh, I, this week I should send out new groups. Um, uh, so probably after our presentation on Wednesday, I'll uh, send out the, the new groups for the last project. I'll announce the specifics of the project next week. Popsicle bridge uh, challenge. So you'll design a bridge. You'll have a poster um, that you'll present with. A little, little different than the poster that you're working on for your failure analysis. And then we'll uh, do those presentations and we'll load test the bridges and that'll kind of wrap up the lecture class component. And then the last piece for the class is you'll have one more final individual paper. It's due, uh, I think I've got that scheduled for Monday of finals. Question, yeah. Twenty. I know twenty third Thanksgiving. Correct. So twenty third is uh, Thursday and twenty fourth Friday. So we don't have class anyways, but I think all PSU classes are canceled those days. Um, so if you have other classes that would be a Thursday, Friday, this would be not occurring. Okay. So that's kind of where we're at. Uh, so let me jump into topic for today. So construction. So my objectives here describe the responsibilities of some of the pertinent and important roles to understand on a construction site. Those roles being project manager, superintendent, cost estimator, and project engineer. We're going to talk about uh, three different ways that contracts for construction can be set up. So I'll be able to list those, kind of be able to explain the differences. And then we're going to talk about just kind of different ways to build things. And those ways to build things is typically referred to as means and methods. So be able to explain that, and I'm going to run through some examples, kind of helping to illustrate how you can have a particular design that you're wanting to accomplish and different methods to accomplish that design. So construction is a pretty, pretty exciting field, I think, um, and in particular for a young engineer to get out, get some experience, get your hands dirty, see things get built. Uh, it's pretty dynamic. Um, I mean, it's one of the things, you know, my first job, so after college, I went into the Peace Corps, came back from the Peace Corps, had that first uh, sort of office job in Atlanta with Parsons. It was a large engineering company. Um, and, you know, that was kind of a difficult transition for me. Then I moved west coast and worked for Perry Form Work that was in the construction industry. And uh, that got me hooked. Like, it was fast-paced, um, getting out on the field, seeing things get built. It was just fun. Um, so I really, really enjoyed that. Um, we'll talk about, uh, you know, what that can be, and it's, it's maybe not for everybody, but uh, it's certainly a fun part of any project. So, quick question. A little poll of hands. How much revenue do you think is generated each year in the USA 
choices, 500 million, 5 billion, 50 billion, or 150 billion. How many people say A? How many people say B? 5 billion. How many people say C? 50 billion. Anybody say D? Okay, so most votes were for C. So here's the chart from 2012, 2017. You know, we're upwards of 150 billion. I don't have more recent numbers, but it's probably exceeding that now. So it's huge industry, right? Tons of work, tons of opportunities. Um, it's just a, a large player in our just economics of our entire nation. Uh, so huge, huge role. So, construction, uh, you know, there are a lot, because it's so big, there's so many different roles that you could fulfill in it. So, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the traditional roles that an engineer can fulfill within the construction sector. But that umbrella of $150 billion, you know, is so large. And when you've got that much money, there's so many different little unique niches that you could fall into. Case in point, Marie, that was talking to us last week. You know, she's like working with drones and doing all sorts of different things that like you're not going to take any classes in. It's all kind of, you know, there, there's a, a need in industry that they've identified like, hey, how can we do things quicker? How can we be more efficient? You know, if we save man hours, personnel hours, you know, building something, that's expensive. So if we can cut a week off the schedule, that saves us money. And they'll, you know, any way that you can figure out how to do that, they're, they're willing to go down that route. But, you know, so some of the traditional roles that uh, construction uh, engineers will work on, you know, really is, you know, helping with that whole sort of coordination to get something built. And as you get more into your classes, junior, senior level, you start to sort of see some of the complexity, some of the technical nature of engineering. For some people, that a light bulb goes off that they're just like, yes, I finally see how it comes together. I love this. I really like design, want to do design, and that's wonderful. Some people, light bulb goes off to like, holy crap, this is tough. I don't want the stress of like doing these calcs day in and day out. Um, and for, you know, if that's your light bulb, construction can be a wonderful avenue because the design part is handled by other people. You know, this is more kind of the business side of like getting stuff built. Um, and so you can be involved in that whole process and feel the rewards of the tangibility of getting something built, but not all the stress as far as like making sure you're designing it right. Um, you know, just looking at the uh, Florida International Bridge, you know, so like those engineers, big engineers, they've got that responsibility of making sure the design's right, everything. Um, the contractor is supposed to build it right. Obviously, they both fail in that project. Um, but, um, yeah, it's a little different perspective. So, $150 billion, you've got all different types of personnel that go into construction. And so, in many ways, that's a strength of the industry, and it's a very diverse uh, environment. Um, so, you've got uh, really skilled builders of all sorts that are working in their craft helping get things built. So you've got carpenters, you've got plumbers, you've got electricians, uh, different sort of trade, you know, iron workers, etc. Uh, that they're doing the heavy lifting. They're doing all the sort of hard manual labor, lifting things out there in the cold, cold weather, getting things built. And they're very skilled and good at what they do. And then you know the the role that you would be filling uh, as a engineer going into this sector is a little more on the managerial side, but you're going to be interfacing and working with them on a day-in, day-out basis. Um, so it's just kind of good to understand the, the nature of the work and the nature of the diversity of the field there. Um, and because of that, you know, it has a little different flavor than the design office. Your design office, everyone pretty much working there, they've come from school, they've got their bachelor's or more. Um, and so it's just a more professional um, uh, professional environment that gives a little different flavor 
been out on the construction site where it's, you know, maybe a little bit more, more just getting your hands dirty and uh, attracts a different type of personnel. Um, and so it gives a different feel to your day in, day out sort of work environment. It can be either a plus or a minus depending on what it is you're looking for. So if we look at a kind of general hierarchy here as far as a construction company, you know, you've got a bunch of administration roles up there, but then for your, your main sort of project level, you've got these green and then there's your uh, blue roles underneath. And so for any sort of project, you've got a superintendent and a project manager that they're sort of team players. They're um, the main personnel accomplishing that project. And you'll have engineers sort of helping out with both of them as far as their goals. The third sort of umbrella there, cost estimating, that's kind of the important umbrella that any company has to have to win the work in the first place. So we'll talk about the different contract delivery methods here shortly, but one of the traditional ways that contracts are won is that something goes out to bid. So there's a set of drawings produced by design engineers. And a bunch of contractors want to win that work, so they look at all those drawings, they come up with some cost. You know, in order to do that, they look at the drawings, they do material takeoff, try and estimate how much material is needed, how quickly they would be able to do that, so how many people they would need to hire. You know, really difficult procedure for a really complicated project to come up with. But ultimately, they come up with, you know, their price. It's going to cost us $10 million. It's going to cost us $11 million goes to bid and somebody wins that work. So that's that whole sort of side of sort of cost and estimate. It's just kind of looking at numbers, crunching numbers based on the drawings uh, to, to win work for the construction company. Once they've won that work, then you sign the contract, the contractor's gonna build the work, and then you know it falls on the, the shoulders of the superintendent, project manager, and all the personnel helping to support them. The main big distinction between the superintendent and the project manager is that the superintendent is the on-site boss. So when you go to the construction site and everything that's happening on site is ultimately the responsibility and managed by the superintendent. So the activities that are going on, the personnel that are on the site, the safety, resolving any sort of conflict, et cetera, that's all the superintendent. They're the big boss. And you know, I talked some about experiences I've had with superintendents before. You know, they're some of the most skilled professional people I've ever come in contact with. Because the skill set you have to have and the knowledge, like they're really, really impressive individuals. Uh, so the project manager, they're dealing with all the other elements of the project that are not pertinent to the day-in, day-out activities. So a lot of the sort of contracts um, and other things that we'll get into here shortly. So these are kind of, uh, I guess I got definitions here for your, your notes, so you can refer back to them, just sort of going through each one of those. But So cost estimating, talking about that sort of role I just described where you're looking at the drawings, coming over with your bill of materials to, to win work. The most critical aspect of this is, you know, on the front end where you're bidding against all the companies to win the work, but cost estimators also have roles that they're fulfilling during the life cycle of a project because, you know, let's say they, they win the work, 10, excuse me, $10 million, okay, they're out on the site, well then, they haven't sort of figured out every little detail for a $10 million project, you know, on that sort of front end. As they sort of dig into the work, they start to see like, oh, hey, this part now, we're at this stage of the project, there are different ways we could accomplish it. And they might be sending out quotes to, to different people, different vendors, maybe looking at a few different op options, how they could sort of price out a job. Uh, and so cost estimators are still involved in the life cycle of those types of decisions. But you know, the real heavy lifting is on that front end when they work. One of the nice things for engineers that sort of get hired into construction is that a lot of firms will have 
roles in the first like two year cycle where you can sort of rotate through these roles where you can sort of work three to six months as a cost estimator, get some experience there, then sort of move out to a, a site engineer where you're out on the construction site, getting to experience the day in, day out type activities, and then maybe more project engineer role working under the project manager, kind of see more of that contract uh, uh, and managerial side. So you can sort of get a flavor of all those different roles you could fulfill. And you know, depending on your interest, you could continue to cycle through different stages like that throughout your career. Or some people gravitate towards a certain one, like, hey, I love cost estimating. That's what I want to do. And you can sort of do that 100% of the time. So that <clears throat> ability to kind of have lots of different roles and wear diff lots of different hats and get that experience early in your career is kind of a nice, nice opportunity. So project engineer, this is kind of a generic term to anyone like yourselves that would be graduating with your bachelor's, going into the construction field. And this project engineer role really is either going to be generally on, on, on site, working underneath the superintendent, or it's going to be under the project manager, helping sort of manage more of the contract side of the work. And so if we talk about how that sort of lays out, so at the beginning of a project, You've got a project manager that's helping to set up contracts. They're usually the main point of contact with the client. So let's say the new science building here at Portland State. Your client is Portland State, so project manager, um, capital projects development, Portland State that sort of manages that. They're usually going to be interfacing directly with the project manager. That project manager is usually uh, dealing more with the design discipline, so the architects, the engineers, different people that are producing the drawings, they're in communication with them, largely. They're setting up the contracts. So you have a contract, let's say you set up a subcontract with you know, some lighting vendor, some uh, concrete subcontractor, some, you know, all, all sorts of different contracts that you have to set up. They're doing all the sort of paperwork, getting those contracts, doing different competitive bids against them. And you know, then ultimately, as those contracts need to be fulfilled over the life of a project, they're going to be paying out to the sub subcontractors during the life of the project, making sure that things are being built on time, and they're making money, and they're getting that out, et cetera. So you could be working on that sort of contract side with the project manager. If you're the project engineer out on the construction site, then you're dealing more with the day-to-day -day activities. So day-to-day -day activities, there's usually lots of equipment moving, coming in and out of the site. That's got to be coordinated. You know, how many people have been, you know, driving by a construction site and you see all these like big trucks lining up the road? You have to drop off material or deliver material. You know, if you don't coordinate that, you could have a hundred trucks just like show up on site and there's just going to block the roads. There's no way you can efficiently sort of get equipment in or get equipment out. No one's going to be able to get their work done. And so you've got to just coordinate. A lot of coordination. Figuring out what material is happening, what activities are happening for the day. Trying to make sure everyone knows that so that you can be safe. Um, people are aware of the activities going on on the site. As those skilled laborers are working on elements, they're looking at the drawings, coming up with a plan to sort of get something built, sometimes they run into issues. They've got a conflict. Then they're talking with the on-site field engineer to resolve that conflict. And sometimes it might just be, you know, clarifying the detail on the drawing. Sometimes, to even though as on the design side, we try and come up with the best design we can. Sometimes our drawings are incomplete and we've got two details that we produced that they're not compatible. You know, you could either do this or this, but you can't do both. And we had a both in our drawings. Which one is the contractor supposed to do? So in those cases, the field engineer is going to send out a RFI. It's a short uh, abbreviation for request for information. And so it's just kind of asking the engineer or whoever, okay, you've got these two different details. 
or maybe you left this detail out. How do you want us to accomplish this? Sometimes the, de the engineer might provide a detail of how they want something built, and based on your experience uh, in the construction sector or some of those skilled professionals, their experience, they suggest an alternative where they're like, hey, the engineer wants us to do it this way, but we can do it much faster and cheaper, and this is going to be a better solution if we do it this other way. Can we get approval for that? That'd be another example of RFI where you sort of say, hey, we want to propose this alternative method. Is this acceptable? And so lots of coordination between you know, the engineers and, and the site personnel, et cetera. And one of the difficulties with uh, getting things built over historical projects has been that these drawings that are the contract requirement to get something built, often there's so many revisions happening to those drawings over the life cycle of the project, that it's difficult just to track those revisions because you've got the initial issuing of the drawings. You've got a 100-page drawing set. And then as a request for information goes in and then they get the response back, then that response back is the current answer to how these two conflicting details in the drawing set which one you should do. And so you got to keep track of like, oh, this is what we need to follow, not this other detail. And so just being able to keep track of all that has is, is been a big challenge in industry. Technology is improving that a lot. Most firms now have a live PDF set of the drawing set where, you know, as soon as that engineer gets that update from the engineer on the correct detail, then they can just go into the PDF and you know put a big X over the one that's not supposed to be right, and then they've got a, a link you can click to sort of open up the new detail, and so it's right there. And so the personnel on site, instead of flipping through this old paper set of drawings that might be right, might be wrong, they just have iPads, you know, and they click on the drawing, they you know have instantly the right version to look at because it's a, a live version that's instantly updated. So I'm sure I haven't covered all the sort of roles that you'd be filling on site, but at least that sort of gives you a, a bit of a, a perspective into some of the roles that you'd be filling as a project engineer, either on the contract side, under the project manager, or on the day-to-day -day side. With the superintendent. And yeah, that superintendent I've already sort of talked about, you know, they're the, they're the big boss on site. They're ultimately responsible for every, everything, making sure things are getting built. Per the drawings, on schedule, on budget, troubleshooting any anything that comes up on site. Uh, they're the big boss. And yep, project manager, they're they're team players. You know, basically everything that if it's a uh, an issue that applies to what's happening today or this week on the construction site, you're going to the superintendent. If it's something more long term, you know, then you go into that project manager, and they're in constant uh, communication between each other. I guess it takes team to get something built. So I've already alluded to this, but construction's fun. You know, you get uh, to see tangibly day in day out. You're going out there to the site, and it happens fast. You know, change is visible, and it just feels rewarding to sort of go out and see the fruits of your labor, and to see the you know, tangible structures rise up from the ground and get built. Uh, it's really rewarding and fun uh, to participate in that, that process. And so you, if you like the environment and like the sort of um, nature of the work, you certainly can have a wonderful career in construction full time. By the same token, if you like that design side, and you want to be the one crunching the numbers, producing the drawings, this is still a super exciting stage of your project. You know, on that design side, you kind of get to see the, the cradle to the grave life cycle of the project, where you go all the way from early preliminary design through final design, getting it permitted, now it goes to construction, and then you get to come out here and you're meeting with the, the on-site field engineers and superintendent, uh, you know, 
reviewing work as it's sort of getting uh, getting built, making sure that it just matches your drawings. So I think it's a fun, exciting time wherever you fall within the industry. If you do go the construction site uh, uh, sort of avenue where you're going to be out on site, you know, it's it's more of a um, you know, get your hands dirty kind of environment. And so for some personnel, they love that. You know, it's so exciting, so rewarding to be out there um, on site, seeing the future uh, fruit of your labor, getting your hands dirty, seeing things get built. Super exciting. But for other people, you know, they wouldn't want to work in that type of environment. They like going into the office and having a nice sort of warm desk and you know, a cup of coffee, et cetera, and stuff. So it's you know, just depending on what uh, your ideal scenario is as far as work environment. This could either be a huge plus or a huge minus. Okay, so contract delivery methods. The traditional one, so originally this was the only method that you would have a design team. That design team would be engineers, architects that would be producing a set of drawings. They would fully complete a set of drawings until it's 100% permitted, ready to build, and then it would go to bid. That's where contractors then would be looking at that set of drawings, you know, crunching numbers, trying to figure out what their cost is. We go to the bid opening, read the bids out, and generally speaking, you know, the low bid would win the work. Once that contract is awarded, then the construction company would mobilize to the site, start setting up contracts, start hiring, you know, vendors and subcontractors and doing the work from bottom up. And so it's a very kind of linear project, you know, flow that you complete the design, get it permitted. And you go to bid, award the work to the general contractor. Then the contractor starts the construction and does it until it's complete. Um, and this is, Used to be the only method, and it still probably is 90% of projects fall under this realm because it's just kind of a normal, natural flow to the project. Some projects take a long time. So the bigger the project, the longer this timeline is going to take. And so some projects to fully design might take a couple years, fully design. Then you sort of have this sort of big, getting the contract figured out, that might take, you know, six months or so to kind of do bid, do all the contracts, et cetera. Then you start construction. Construction can often take like, you know, a big project, three to five years type thing. And so from cradle to grave, it could be easily a 10 year project. If you have a client like uh, Portland State, you know, we've got, need for a new science building. We don't want to wait 10 years until we can get that facility built and get students using it, get researchers using it, et cetera. And so we want to figure out, well, how can we get it built faster? So that's really the big driver for these alternative methods. And usually they're used for larger projects like that, where it's a really long project duration, really expensive project, and they want to sort of condense it down and get it built quicker. And so there are two different methods I'll, I have listed here. One is this construction manage, management at risk uh, type, and the other one is design build. At the heart, these are very, very similar. Basically, the idea is in order to get this built quicker, and if you can get it built quicker, that's where the big, biggest cost of this whole sort of project life cycle is. It's not in the design phase, it's in the construction phase. That's where the big dollars are as far as money for it. They pay now to get this built. And so if we can get it built quicker, that's going to save construction dollars. We're ultimately going to save money as an owner. But in order to get the construction built quickest or quicker, you've got to hire the contractor earlier. 
And so in order to hire the contractor earlier, we often, what we do is we look to, instead of completing the design and having contractors sort of bid based on their estimated cost, based on the drawings, we have a selection phase to hire the contractor more based on qualifications. And so we say, okay, we want to hire that construction firm way back here in the design phase so that they can actually participate because that process I described earlier where you've got the request for information and sort of back and forth between the contractor and the design firms, that's a slow process. And if you can get the contractor sitting at the same table as the designer earlier on where they're talking through these issues in the design side, you can often streamline that where you don't have to have that back and forth because you've already both sat at the table, decided what would work best, and put that on the drawings. And so the CMGC uh, contract method, what you have is you've got the owner that's financing the project and they hire a design team. Okay, I want to work with this architect, this engineer, you know, this, uh, this set of people. I hire them. You're going to do my design. And then they have a similar process where contractors are going to bid based on qualifications. And usually it's like a not to exceed contract. Um, based on similar projects of size and scope. But then they look at that and they say, okay, I'm going to hire this contractor. And then, boom, you've got your team put together. So you've got your design team that the owner has hired, and you've got your contractor, they've hired. Now you work together, complete the drawings, do the construction, etc. So that con condenses the um, schedule because the contractor's on board early. They're helping to sort of streamline the design process so you don't have as much back and forth. Um, and they break ground sooner uh, with that construction to sort of uh, get it built faster and stay fine. The main distinction between this method and the design build is instead of the owner selecting the design team and the owner selecting the contractor and then saying, you guys work together, in the design build project, the designers and the contractors bid, uh, sort of bid on the project together. So let's say I've got my design firm and I've got a good track record working with Turner Construction. That I could then partner with Turner Construction and we sort of bid to the owner, hey, we're a good team. We want to work together. Um, you know, here, here's, our, here's our team. This is who we're going to work with. And then another engineering firm with another contractor. Hey, we've got a good track record. You know, this is our sort of experience. This is our portfolio of projects. We want them together. And so then the owner looks at those teams of designers and contractors together and selects one team. And so the idea here is that uh, some of the relationships that are built on one project can carry over to another. That you've got a set of team like with Jacobs and Turner that are working together, and then they can uh, take that same team over to another project they've already sort of gone through, developed a good workflow together, so that they will be more efficient. Um, but ultimately, for it, it depends a little bit on the owner if they have a very set like I've had different projects I've financed, and I really like this designer, and I really like this contractor, and they really want to be able to pick and choose. You know, then it's going to be more the CMGC contact type versus if the owner doesn't maybe care quite as much as far as having that control and they want just the teams themselves to have good working relationships, you know, then maybe you go, they go to the design build and contract. Any questions about those delivery methods? There's different ways to sort of bid and Get the contract set up, but these these alternative methods usually are for the, the larger public type projects that are big, big dollar values. And one of the nice things I think about this is too is that these are more qualifications based selection for the contractor, um, and I think that makes a lot of sense versus just a, a low bid type project.
So um, just based on my experience uh, in the sector, you know, sort of to, to run through my take here, I've already shared some of these. So some of the pros, cons, depending on how you look at it, as far as, well, oh, should I have considered construction or not? You know, pro for you could be that there's no design. You know, so if you don't want that headache, you don't want that wor worry, you just want to sort of be involved and, and uh, see the fruits of uh, your labor, that can be a big plus to not have to worry about punching those numbers. You know, going out working on site, not being in an office every day, that can be a huge plus. Certainly the reward, the tangibility of seeing things get built. And, you know, with $150 billion industry, there's a lot of incentive, you know, financial incentive to get things built. And if you uh, get things built on schedule on time or even earlier, often there are uh, bonuses that would be paid to the contractor. And then the contractor will you know, break those bonuses down to their employees. And so you can make a lot of money. And the fast-paced nature, you know, that can just be fun in the sense that if you're busy every single day, you're not watching the clock. You're not worried about like, oh, I've got my eight hours in yet because you're just busy throughout the day. There's so much going on that it makes your day just fly by. And so that can just be uh, rewarding and fun that way because you're you're just enjoying what you're doing. You know, some of the negatives I see that, uh, you know, for myself, I sort of struggled with, because I like a lot of the aspects of uh, construction, was that I kind of like crunching the numbers. I like kind of doing the design. Um, and so for me, that was a negative, that if I worked just for a contractor, I didn't get to do that. If you end up gravitating towards the field engineer role, where you're working out on site, you got to get to the site wherever it is. And so your commute changes job to job. You know, sometimes your commute might just be 10 miles down the road and really close to where you work or where you live. Other times it might be an hour and a half away. Um, you know, there are individuals, like I have a colleague that I used to work with that he went into tunneling. He goes, you know, wherever the tunneling jobs are. And there are quite a few tunneling jobs along the West Coast, but still, like, he might be doing one project in L.A., then he's doing one project in Seattle, then he's doing another project, you know, in San Francisco. Um, and, uh, you know, if you enjoy the work and you enjoy the travel and, you know, that life cycle is attractive to you, great. But for some people, it's not. You know, they want a more stable sort of scenario where, like, I want to live at home, I want to see my kids at night, you know, et cetera. And so that can be a little bit more of a challenge. If uh, that is a negative for you, you could can go more on the uh, project manager side for construction firms because that's a little bit more stable. So I think Marie, who was with us last week, you know, she works at Skanska's main office, and she's more on the sort of managerial side, not sites. She would go out to visit sites, but not as her daily job. And so in that sense, it was more stable and you sort of, you're just going into the, the normal sort of construction office every single day, usually. Um, and so if, if that's more what you want, there's still opportunities in the field. Um, so you kind of figure that out. Um, and because construction is fast paced and a big push to kind of get things built quicker and faster uh, and on schedule, you know, often the hours can be more. So work starts early, and you know it can certainly be more than 40 hours. And so for some people, they don't really care. You know, they 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 enjoy their job. They don't care if it's sort of 45, 50 hours. Um, they make more money, and you know it's a big plus. But for other individuals, you know that's a negative. And you know, the last one there is just that, uh, you know, you interact with a lot of different diverse people that are, in many ways is a strength of the construction industry. But at the same time, it can be a little bit more of a brusque, kind of harsh environment. And sometimes because of the you know, stress involved and getting things built and big dollars involved, 
sometimes you know those emotions boil up. And so I've been on construction sites where I'm out in a meeting and people are yelling because they're stressed, you know, and they're really kind of animated about what's going on. And in the design office, when I've been in the design office, like I've never been yelled at. You know, it's much just more professional, sort of low, low key, lower boiling point sort of environment. And so, you know, I think if you work in the uh, construction sector, you got to have a little bit thicker skin in that sense, just that you don't take it personal. You just understand, you know, people are stressed, people are sort of dealing with things that, um, you know, you kind of brush it off and work together. Any questions so far? Yeah. So you were saying like your friend can like work and travel different states. How does that work if you're licensed in one particular state? Is it just based on like the company? Does it like how does that work? Well, so that's a great uh, question. So on the design side, you're producing the drawings. You've got to be licensed in the state that the project is issued in. And so like for myself, I'm licensed in four different states. Uh, so I just do work in four different states. For a lot of firms, um, you know, say like Jacobs, you know, Jacobs does work in all 50 states. They're going to have engineers that are licensed in all 50 states. Um, and so if they've got a project in Florida, they're going to have a Florida PE stamp. If they've got a project in Oregon, they're going to have an Oregon PE stamp. Um, but on the construction side, to be a field engineer or project engineer working on the project manager, there's no requirement to become a licensed professional engineer. Um, and so you can travel and work in the different states and everything where the project is on the construction side and not have to worry about licensure. And so that can be a plus minus too, right? You know, that's sort of the design component um, that you know, if you want to get your PE and be licensed and have that responsibility, uh, you're not really going to probably do that in the construction sector, but um, you would on the design side. So. All right, <clears throat> so, um, you know, again, it's this huge umbrella under construction. And so what I've talked about so far is some of the traditional bread and butter roles that you could work on uh, as a project engineer on construction sites. But as Marie shared last week, you know, there are lots of different roles you can fulfill. And one that I've kind of worked in is more on the construction engineering side. And the construction engineering side is often where you're kind of dealing more with these means and methods, um, how you can sort of design and build things, methods to do that. And um, you know, that can be a very, uh, very sort of exciting side of the industry and one that sort of straddles a little bit some of the design components um, and sort of structural engineering type elements with you know, construction activities that are on site. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of this now. So certainly I got my you know, foot in the door working for Prairie Formwork that's a concrete formwork supplier. Um, there are lots of other sort of equipment suppliers that would be involved uh, in this sort of general role. Um, and then you know, there are a lot of construction engineering firms and, the, and these could be, there are a handful of firms that would specialize specifically in construction engineering, but there are other ones that are more just maybe traditional structural engineering firms that uh, do some construction type work. So before I dig into some spe specific examples, I think I just wanted to sort of jump through a video showing how a project can go sort of from ground up uh, to the top and some of the typical activities that occur. And so, you know, this is a time lapse video. I'm going to jump through, jump forward because it's 12 minutes long. Uh, but here you can see the first stage is just earthwork, right? you got to dig down. Often you've got some, some parking or some lower below ground activities. And you got to dig down and get uh, down to the bottom of the hole. And so that involves a lot of earthwork, digging activities, putting in retaining walls um, as you're sort of doing that. And this stage of the project takes a long time. And now here they've gotten to the bottom of the hole. Now they're pouring their concrete foundation. They're putting up their crane tower foundation, install the crane on the site to help sort of with those construction activities. 
And once you get that initial sort of concrete poured, uh, you know, then things really start progressing because it's a little bit um, uh, just more more established site. You get the earthwork equipment out and sort of start with your other sort of trades. And so the first major component that goes up is all the structural elements. So the lower grade is usually uh, concrete elements, so concrete foundations. Usually the first couple levels going up is sort of uh, concrete walls and columns and things of that nature. And so you'll have all this sort of rebar installed, pouring the concrete, scheduling the trucks coming out. There you can see the trains are pouring different decks, etc. And you know, it keeps sort of moving up. And so you know, this is a timeline video from you know when they did the, the initial excavation. That probably was oh three to six months for that initial excavation. Uh, they got to the bottom there, and now up they're up uh, what two levels? Yeah, you know, this might be another sort of uh, uh, six months on the project schedule there. And you can see they've got other site activities happening over here. So all the sort of scheduling and trying to sort of figure out when you do what, um, making sure you're getting all the equipment needed on site there, scheduling it so it's not in conflict with other things, um, is all sort of what the contractor is trying to sort of figure out. And you sort of get that skeleton sort of built up to the top as far as all those sort of structural elements that really um, are is the skeleton of your structure. And then once you get that structural stuff built, then you come back and you start dealing with all the sort of finish work inside. And so before you start finishing out the inside, you're probably first going to put up the uh, perimeter sort of waterproof barriers. So you're going to put up your perimeter walls and make a waterproof barrier to keep the elements out. You know, so this is like you're putting up your glass finishing, etc. And then once you get that installed, so the lower levels are waterproof and weatherproof, then you'll start putting up your your paint and your carpet and your lighting and your plumbing and all that sort of things. Um, and doing all that sort of more finish work. Um, and that takes a long time. You know, get all that product in and finish all that out. But that kind of gives you a little bit of a flavor. You see all the sort of light work and landscaping, etc. that sort of happened there on the side. So you sort of get 